Hola amigos, que tal? It's Joe here from Spain Speaks with an update on the current situation here in Spain, day 250 of the current situation. That's right, 250 days since the state of alarm was announced here in this country and the coronavirus decided to interrupt our lives. There's also another important milestone today and that is that the channel has reached 40,000 subscribers. So a big thanks to everybody who has subscribed to the channel over the years. Again, a big thanks to all of the people that left comments on the last video. Lots of comments, lots of debate happening there as usual. A big thanks to the people that supported the channel through a small donation. You can see your names here. Thanks to the people who have bought merchandise and a big thanks as always to my patrons on Patreon for your support. Now let's get into some of the news and see what's happening around the country at the moment. I mentioned yesterday that some autonomous communities have decided to extend their perimeter confinements. This is in part due to the fact that we have some important public holidays coming up in coming weeks. And we all know that the autonomous communities here in Spain want to get the health situation under control as much as they can before the Christmas season arrives. We can see here which communities will be closed due to the coronavirus restrictions during the December bridge or long weekend. The autonomous communities do not seem willing to ease restrictions against the coronavirus for the moment, perhaps looking at the proximity of the December long weekend. Although the latest indicators of infection of coronavirus seem to reflect some stabilization of the second wave in Spain, the numbers of deaths are still dramatic and some communities are far from relaxing restrictions. At the moment, it is known that five autonomous communities will be closed for the long weekend that celebrates the Constitution and the Day of Immaculate Conception. The Valencian community, Castilla-La Mancha, Navarra, Cantabria and Catalonia will maintain the perimeter closure of their territories at least until after the December holidays. So various autonomous communities there deciding to keep their borders closed at least until those public holidays at the beginning of December are over. And I imagine that more autonomous communities will announce closures the closer we get to those dates. And remember that the date for those public holidays is the 6th and 8th of December. So the majority of people in Spain, I imagine, will be confined to their autonomous communities during that period. Now, we all know that Madrid is building a new hospital as a result of the coronavirus pandemic here in the country. They're calling it the Pandemic Hospital, and we can see that this hospital will be open before the December long weekend. At the end of next week or the beginning of the following week, the Isabel Zendal Nurse Emergency Hospital in Val de Bebas will start operating. This was announced yesterday by the Minister of Health, Enrique Ruiz Escudero, who assured that the hospital centre continues at full speed in every way. So Madrid planning to open this new pandemic hospital by the beginning of December. This hospital, of course, like most things here in Spain, has been a little bit controversial and still some doubts over exactly how they're going to staff the hospital, where the doctors and nurses are going to come from. A couple of weeks ago, the Madrid president was quizzed over this matter and she didn't really come up with any clear answers. So we'll wait and see if they can find people to staff this hospital in coming weeks. We'll wait and see. Now, the Madrid president also gave us an update on the COVID passport that she has been talking about for various months. We can see here that a USO's COVID primer or COVID book will be implemented in the next few days with a decaffeinated version. It will only be informative. The measure announced by the president of the Madrid community arrives two months late and will not be used to access closed spaces such as gyms, cinemas and museums. So Madrid's immunity passport or immunity book or COVID card, whatever you want to call it, about to be implemented. Although, as we saw there in a decaffeinated version or a light version of what was originally planned. So it's going to be interesting to see what this book is exactly and how it is to be used. Now, with Spain currently in the middle of the second wave of the coronavirus, it's interesting to see that some autonomous communities are experiencing worse data than during the first wave of the pandemic. We can see here that four communities have already registered more deaths in the second wave of the coronavirus than in the first. Although at a national level, the first wave has claimed, at least for now, more than twice as many deaths as the second. Andalusia, Aragon, Asturias and Murcia, in addition to Ceuta and Melilla, have already registered more deaths from coronavirus in this second wave of the pandemic than in the first according to data provided by the Ministry of Health. All of them have added more deaths between the 6th of August and November the 15th than in the previous period from March the 13th to June the 21st. And recent data from the National Statistics Institute shows that in Spain, 71,000 more people have died this year than in a normal year since the start of the pandemic. 
The National Institute of Statistics, the INE, in its update of the figures on the number of deaths each week in Spain, leaves revealing data. Since the beginning of March, at the beginning of the pandemic, until November the 8th, in Spain, 70,999 more people have died than in a normal year. So there we go, close to 71,000 excess deaths here in Spain this year between the months of March and November. So it's going to be interesting to see what the skeptics about this virus say regarding those figures and whether they still think that it's just the flu. Now let's have a look at the health data around the country at the moment, starting with the country as a whole and some of the autonomous communities in the country. And we can see that the risk level around the country is still extreme. The total amount of cases there topping the 1.5 million mark. The accumulated incidence rate in the last 14 days, 452.57. The official number of deceased, according to the health ministry, sits at 42,039. Deaths in the last seven days, 1,346. Hospital pressure now, we can see that there are currently 19,403 COVID patients hospitalized. And there are 3,120 patients in ICUs, which is 32.04% of ICUs in Spain. The Madrid community now, we can see that the risk level is also extreme. The total amount of cases, the accumulated incidence rate in the last 14 days, 312.51. Deaths in the last seven days, 98. Hospital pressure, 2,404 COVID patients in hospitals in the Madrid community. And there are 397 COVID patients in ICUs, which is 31.81% of all ICUs in Madrid. The Valencian community now, extreme risk in that area. Total amount of cases, the accumulated incidence rate in the last 14 days, 299.21. Deaths in the last seven days, 107. We can see that there are currently 1,780 COVID patients in hospitals, and there are 304 COVID patients in ICUs, which is 30.10% of all ICUs in the Valencian community. And finally, the Canary Islands, we can see that there is a medium risk level there. The total amount of cases, the accumulated incidence rate for the last 14 days sits at 83.08, the lowest in Spain. We can see the total amount of deceased in the Canary Islands, 319 in the last nine months. Deaths in the last seven days, 10. Hospital pressure in the Canaries, 242 COVID patients currently hospitalized, and there are 51 patients in ICUs which translates to 11.51% of all ICUs in the Canary Islands. Now, I mentioned in yesterday's video that the main objective of governments around the country is to save the Christmas season. We know that all of these rules and regulations, curfews and confinements are being done in order to have some type of normality at Christmas time. And there's even some autonomous communities that want massive antigen testing to take place before Christmas. Madrid, for example, wants to carry out mass antigen tests in pharmacies before Christmas. The vice president of the Madrid community, Ignacio Iguado, said this Tuesday that his objective is that before Christmas, all Madrillians, before meeting with their families, take or have the option of taking a free antigen test in pharmacies. So a very ambitious plan for some autonomous communities here in Spain to try to test everybody before Christmas. For example, in the community of Madrid, there's 6 million people living here. In Catalonia, I think there's 7.5 million. So I imagine that it's going to be very, very difficult to test that many people in less than a month. And I don't know if it's possible from a logistics point of view. But again, we'll wait and see. Now let's have a look at some of the comments from recent videos. One here from Ivan. Why do so many stores have to close for being non-essential, but bigger chains like Lidl and similar stores can sell those non-essential items like shoes, clothes, and home stuff? Nonsense, throwing families into poverty. Yeah, Ivan, thanks for the comment and good point. Small businesses forced to close if they're considered non-essential, yet big chains like Carrefour, uh, Lidl, as you mentioned there, Audi, are allowed to stay open and sell items like the ones that you mentioned there, clothes, shoes, etc. Lots of small businesses going under. Lots of families will lose their businesses, will lose their incomes, and many will be forced, unfortunately, as you said, into poverty. I don't understand it, but if the government shuts your business down because they consider that it is not an essential service, then obviously they have to come up with the cash to support those businesses while they are closed. Is it happening? I don't know, but I hope so. One here from Michael. Ola Stewart, keep up the good work. I've just been outside Denia on the Costa Blanca. We have seen people flip their places of residency from Madrid to Denia, so they work in Madrid during the week, but returning to the Valencia area at the weekend. As they are going to Madrid for work and returning to our area at the weekend, they are doing nothing illegal. 
but it is no surprise that cases are rising here. Keep up the good work. Many thanks. Yeah, Michael, thanks for the comment. I have heard that this is happening, that people are changing their place of residence. Quite an easy thing to do. You just go to the local council and change your empadronamiento. And to be honest, a lot of people here in Spain don't change their place of residency. I know various people that have moved to a different autonomous community or to a different region, but maintain their official residence in the place that they were born or the place where their parents live for example. So it's fairly common for people to do that as well. But as you said, there's nothing illegal about this. People are allowed to return to their place of residence, even if there is a confinement in place. And that's obviously what some people are doing. Should they be doing it? Probably not, but uh, very hard to stop everybody. Want to hear from Richard? Ola Stewart, greetings from Melbourne, Australia. Many thanks for your tireless efforts recording all these videos. I stumbled across your page and have watched most of the videos over the last year or so to get a better understanding of life in Spain as a foreigner. My wife and I spent time in Barcelona and Malaga in 2019 and instantly fell in love and have toyed with the idea of moving before COVID happened, but those plans may be on hold for now. What's your views on a post-COVID Spanish world as a place to migrate and live? Yeah, Richard, thanks for the comment and good to see that these videos are helpful to you and your wife who fell in love with Spain on a visit here back in 2019. Lots of people do the same thing. Spain is a very attractive country for many, many people. They come here, see the Mediterranean lifestyle, see the way the country operates, and fall in love with it immediately. Lots and lots of people in the same boat as you this year. The plans have been put on hold because of COVID-19, but Spain is still, in my opinion, an attractive destination and will be in the future post-COVID. I think things will start to get back to normal. There might be some financial problems for the next few years, but if you don't depend on the local economy, I suppose that is not your case. I always recommend that it's better not to rely on the local economy if you're coming to live here, unless you're willing to teach English or you have specialist skills in IT or something along those lines, or if you can work remotely and get your income from outside the country. But as I just said, I think Spain is still going to be an attractive place to live, but I'll open the question up to the community to get their thoughts on the matter. Will Spain still be an attractive place to live post-COVID? Let us know your thoughts. Want to hear from John High Stewart, the person who said it was Santander is mistaken. It is in fact TSB Bank who were taken over by Sabadell a few years back. Fortunately for me, I had accounts in both, and when I sold an apartment in Spain, there was no fee to pay when transferring money back to the UK other than the exchange rate. Yeah, John, thanks for the comment. I couldn't remember the name of the bank that Sabadell bought in the UK. Thanks for reminding me, TSB. TSB was actually the bank that I opened an account with when I moved to the UK back in 2001 for a couple of years, and Sabadell Bank took it over a few years ago. Banco Santander also have quite a big presence in the UK. I think the last time I was in London, I saw Banco Santander around the place, and I know various people from Spain who went to live in London as a result of Santander buying Abbey National, I think it was many, many years ago. So Spain has a big banking presence in the UK. Unfortunately, you don't see a very big UK banking presence in Spain. It's one of the things that I've never been able to understand. Various banks from the UK have come to Spain. Barclays, of course, tried to crack the Spanish market, but I don't think that they were very successful. So it seems to be that Spanish banks can go to the UK and be successful, but British banks can't come to Spain and be successful. I don't know what the reason for that is. Maybe it's the way banking is done in this country, or maybe it's because the locals don't trust foreign banks. I don't know. What do you reckon? One here from Adrian. Hi, Stuart. Are you sure that this episode was recorded in Madrid? Wearing a coat like that is more appropriate for Anchorage, Alaska. Keep up the good work. Yeah, Adrian, thanks for the comment. Obviously referring to the video that I did yesterday when I was sitting outside with quite a thick jacket on. It was quite cold yesterday. A lot of people don't know this, but Madrid can get quite cold. Winters can be very cold here. Summers can be very hot. In fact, the average temperature in winter in the months of December and January is only about six or seven degrees. Can be quite cold. The nights can also get quite cold. In this particular part of the world, it can get down to five below zero, which is obviously not cold compared to Alaska or Canada or some of the countries in the north of Europe. But for here, it is quite cold. But then again, I am a person that feels the cold. Here in Spain, people call me friolero, somebody that feels the cold, friolero. But I would much rather live in a place that's a little bit milder during the winter months. And that's one of the reasons why I'm looking to get out of this particular part of Spain. One here from Callum. Hey, so I've just started my 168-hour TEFL course, and I'm planning on going to Madrid after I'm done with it. 
I wanted to ask you, I am fully fluent in Spanish and English. Do you recommend me putting this on my CV? Would it be an advantage? I also wanted to mention I am 19 years old and if my age can be an issue regarding getting work, the response would be greatly appreciated. I also don't have a degree. Once I have my TEFL course completed, that's the only qualification I will have. Yeah, Callum, thanks for the comment. Absolutely, you need to put that on your CV. You need to show people that you are fluent in both languages, bilingual if you like, that you're able to speak English fluently and Spanish fluently. It will go a long way when it comes to trying to secure employment in this country teaching English. Obviously, there's going to be some employers that prefer people to have a degree, but I don't think it's fundamental. And uh, getting a TEFL course or a CELTA course is always a good idea. And it shows the potential employers that you know how to handle classroom situation. And as I said, being bilingual will also help. And finally, one here from Paul. Congrats on reaching 40,000 subscribers. Out of interest, do you still teach or have you decided to become a full-time YouTuber instead? Yeah, Paul, thanks for the comment. I am still teaching. At the moment, I'm doing about a 50-50 split. I'm spending about 50% of my time on these videos and about 50% of my time teaching. I have no plans to become a full-time YouTuber because I don't think it's a good idea to put all of the proverbial eggs in the same basket. But I do enjoy making videos and I would like to spend more time doing it in the future. I'd like to get out on the road a little bit more. Unfortunately, it's impossible at the moment. But my plan for the future is to get out on the road as much as possible and show people everything that this country has to offer. But I'll just have to wait until this pandemic is over before I can put that plan into practice. On that note, I'll start to wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the situation out as you normally do. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.